Hello and welcome to a very special video here on One Team in Ayrshire. Today we're in conversation with the self-proclaimed gob on a stick, the man responsible for the We Are Killy chant, Killy TV commentator and all-round Killy fanatic, it's Mr Gavin Wallace. Adam, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on, Gavin. I'm sure there's a lot of fans out there who are, who are desperate to hear uh, you know what you the, the info you've got in and about the club and uh, you know, just about your your career in general, and, and you know your links with Kelly and stuff like that. So, uh, first things first, how's your your lockdown been going? Are you missing football as much as the rest of us have been? Yeah, to the extent I, I am probably annoying all my neighbours. Um, I've been setting up little drills in the car park outside my flat down the bottom. Um, there's a kind of big turn and circle and another bit for parking cars and whatnot. And I've been uh, putting drills. People have maybe seen them on my Instagram and whatnot. But I've been doing drills there. I've been out at the park. One of my neighbours has helped me keep it her social distance. I might add, um, but um, it's it's been it, it's it's. Aye, listen, I think we're all missing football. The the big thing is, as long as everyone stays safe and healthy, that's what we want. Ultimately, we want everyone to stay safe and healthy. It's safe and healthy, and then come back to to rugby park once the restrictions are eventually lifted. But yeah, I think uh, the weekend there we should have been playing Livingston. We should have had a. Uh, supporters Association Player of the Year event, which I was due to be hosting, um, and so you know to miss these events, it, it's huge. But when you put it into perspective, you know what's going on with COVID nineteen and, and coronavirus. Then it, it kind of creates insignificance. But you know, I think it's all relative to everybody. We are missing the football, and I think we all want the football to come back as as quickly and as safely as we can get it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Obviously, everyone knows that you're involved at a professional level, but a lot of people might not know that you're actually an amateur football goalkeeper. So at the same time as as you're you've been doing the professional stuff, you've got to keep you know training as well for that to eventually come back too. Yeah, this was a, a bit of a comeback year. I've had more comebacks than take that. I think to be fair in my football career, but um, was back back playing with the, the boys at Glencairn Thistle. Um, they're a, a great team. We play such just uh, Sunday amateur league, to be fair. But the quality is really good, and we've got a good team. And the thing that's really annoying for us just now is we are top of our division, um, and you know we were kind of potentially on course to to win the league. We had just beat actually um, Lachlan Hyatt, you know the, the editor of the or the sports editor of the Kilmarnock Standard. We just beat his team, Kelly United, um, very comprehensively. I think it was nine three or something. We beat them in the last game before the lockdown. So that kind of extended our gap at the top of the division and I think just all, most of the boys that, that play with us are all Kilmarnock fans so we're all still kind of giving it big licks on the on the, the, the WhatsApp group and things like that but yeah from that kind of point of view you've got to try and keep yourself as fit as you can you don't know when the football is going to come back clearly we're not the same level as, as Kilmarnock or, or any sort of professional team to be fair but you know again it's all relative to us and we all really just want to get back you play football because you love it and that's why we give up Saturdays and Sundays and, and things like that, because we love nothing more than going to and playing football. No, absolutely. So you're almost in a bit of a, a dilemma then, because for the Sunday League, you may want the league to, to end now, and obviously because you're <laughs> top of the league, you might want to, to get the trophy. But on the other hand, obviously we don't want, want the Kelly games to end now, so it's a bit of a, um, yeah. you know, a, a bit of a choice you've got to make there, a decision on what, you, what, what you'd prefer um, in terms of what happens. I, th I think well, I put a tweet out. I got some kind of inside information about what was going to happen. I'd been told that we'll not be playing any football in Scotland until September. It looks as if we could very much still be on track for that just now. And uh, there was a lot of chat around about that. My initial feelings and thoughts, which again I'd put on Twitter, was that you can't really award the league to Celtic and you can't really relegate Hearts right now. And Hearts have still got a chance to... And, and to get me wrong, I kind of fluctuate as to what I think here about it quite a lot but at the time I was quite strong on null and void the season start again you know with the teams that were in Europe last year which includes us um, there was no agenda I was getting absolute dogs abuse um, for, for having an agenda because I'm a Kilmarnock fan a Kilmarnock diehard but that, that wasn't it you know that was that's, you're just going back to statistics of the last fully completed season obviously UEFA have, have since come out and issued a letter to member associations and leagues and clubs and whatnot saying that you know, basically, or trying to flex their muscle about if you finish your league early, you might not get a European place next year and or next season, which I'm not sure I overly buy on a personal level. But you know, without a lot of these teams, these competitions, you the Europa League and the Champions League can't really happen. You know, Belgium have already went first 
you know, saying that they're basically just going to scrap or end the season early as well. So it'll be interesting to see what what comes from that. But going back to our, you know, yeah, it'd be great if uh, the, the the Ayrshire Amateur League, um, if Safa had said to us that, uh, yeah, you've just won it, end of. But again, the teams below us that are only a couple of points behind us in the division would feel aggrieved. I don't think there's going to be an easy way out of this for for any football league, whether you're amateur, junior or professional. You know, I certainly don't envy the task that, that Neil Doncaster and the SPFL board have. I don't envy any football board at the moment or committee that have got to make these these decisions. I think the Euros being moved to 2021 is a good thing. It maybe gives us a bit of time to, to potentially finish the season off. But then it's the, you know, you can argue just you could argue the players could be using this as a pre-season, but it depends what teams furlough their, their players and their workers because if they're furloughed, then they're not allowed to train to the specific club programme. Excuse me, they're not allowed to, to have any sort of communication that way from the work because they're laid, technically they're, they're laid off and it's the government that, that pay their wages. So it's a very a very difficult thing. But yeah, there's a part of me wants, uh, wants their league to say, yeah, like here, you boys have won the division go and have your player of the year. And then there's a big part of me thinks, hang on a minute, Kilmarnock can still make the top six here. You know, at a push, we could still end up inside. We could still sneak in the top six. So it's, I think though, I think, to be fair, I, I think knowing Billy Bowie and Alex Dyer as well as I do and everyone in the club, Kilmarnock, we would probably just abide by and, and take on the chin what the, what the league, what the SPFL de- decide and what they deem is, is fit. There's no point, I don't think, in arguing it. I think you just you get on with it. You dust yourself down and you just go again. Yeah, I think you know there, there's just no right decision at the end of the day. This situation, this situation is so unprecedented. There's just you know there's nothing to compare this to at all, really, in the history of of Scottish football and indeed uh, football across Europe and across the world. But um, as you're saying, no, I think Kilmarnock would be more than happy to just you know apply whatever rules were brought out because. When you think about the season, it's, some points have been good, some points have been bad, but it's just been one of these ones where you maybe want the season to, to come to a conclusion mid-table and then start again for next year because it's just been a bit up and down over the course of the season and uh, maybe just want a fresh start, um, you know, a fresh a fresh season for, for Alex Dyer to, to, to work his magic over the, the summer and see what can happen afterwards. Yeah, I think you're probably right there. To be fair, I think it, uh, it's been we've touched on it as well on the on the We Are Kelly, the club podcast. And I think Stephen O'Donnell has certainly spoke about it. You know, saying that you know whatever happens, happens. It's not been. It's listen. It's not been. We all know that the players will tell you that. Alex Dyer will tell you that. It's not been the best season for us. We've not probably performed as as you know at the levels that we've set ourselves. You know, I think the, the players have set themselves some. Phenomenal standards. We saw that last year or last season under Steve Clark, um, and it's. It, 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 I think maybe maybe a fresh start wouldn't wouldn't be a bad thing. You know, obviously Angelo Alessio left. Yeah, it didn't work out. Alex has come in. It was a slow start. He'll be the first to tell you that. There's been he said it on Kelly TV quite a lot of the times as well. He's been unhappy with the performance, but he's been delighted with some performances. So maybe maybe a fresh start wouldn't wouldn't be. All that bad, I think, for us considering the uh, the the topsy turvy season, the the inconsistent season that, that that we as a club have had. No, absolutely. Um, so so going away from current times for for just now, looking back at at, at your career, you started off at HBSA, um, the hospital radio service, which is where I started at as well. Um, yeah. I mean, I started there when you were thirteen, the youngest yeah. hospital radio presenter in the UK. How did you get How did you get into that so early, and and did you know that that's what you wanted to do for a career. Yeah, it kind of, um, it kind of all escalated from a boy called Chris Woods, who's actually our match day sports presentation producer at Kelly. In effect, he's the boy that he's the guy that presses all the. But Chris and I are the same age and went to school together, and we're, we're really good friends. And it kind of started from him and his dad were involved in uh, an RSL restricted service license station called Bonnet FM, which was based in Stuart and it was on for the Bonnet Guild Festival. It'd be on it two weeks in the summer, it'd be on for a week or so, or a couple of weeks in Christmas, or four weeks in the summer, and, and then two weeks at Christmas. And it was very well received. And that kind of got me into it. That was on when I was still actually at Stuart Academy, I think first and second year. And I always had this kind of passion for being, you know, being on the radio and wanting to be a DJ and stuff like that. And yeah, I would lock myself away in my bedroom when I was ten and eleven, and you know, play stuff out of my play songs out of my CD player into a tape deck, 
and holding it up and then kid on I was being a DJ and used to always enter West FM's competitions and stuff with like Alan Shaw and Colin McCardo. I, you know, I used to look up to him. I'm really good friends with Colin now and he is just a phenomenal broadcaster and it kind of went from there and then Chris and his dad had told me about Hospital Radio and I got in touch with him and it kind of went from there. My dad took me, I got a, a kind of interview, uh, an induction and, and it went from there. They said normally we wouldn't we wouldn't do this type of thing but by that point I was already DJing in, in, in pubs. My first gig came at the Charleston which is a pub in New Farm. I think it's a, I think it's a Chinese restaurant now and a, and a shop. Um, it's just across the road from the from the school, to be fair, in New Farm, across the road from, from there. And I'd done my first gig there, and my dad came with me, and it was a couple of CD players and a mixing desk, and it was just playing some lounge music. And then it all kind of escalated from there, and Oswald Radio came in, and, and they said, look, we'd, we'd love you to be part of it. And they, they gave me one show a week, and then that developed into a few. And then I would I would stay on the school bus, which you probably aren't allowed to do these days. Probably weren't even allowed to do then. It was shuttle buses were a school bus company and I would stay on the bus and because the bus was going to call in and the driver would take a small detour by Irvine Hospital and we'd, I'd go in and do my show then I'd either get the bus back to Kilmarnock and then back to Kilmarnock where my, my folks live and then either that or my dad would come and pick me up and it was just phenomenal and then from there on I just developed this mad passion for, for wanting to be on the radio and get paid to play music and talk mints <laughs> oh, Of course um, obviously you started at Kelly in 2002 but just give us a wee brief synopsis of what happened between your hospital radio years and starting at Kilmarnock um, that year. The, 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 it, was, it was really quite, it was really quite cool. My, 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 my old man was quite involved. Bob, my dad, was, was really involved at Kilmarnock at the time. Um, he was the treasurer for the Youth Development Fund back in the day, before it became the, what is now the Youth Academy. Um, and he was good friends with the Fleetons. He was good friends with Jim McSherry. And basically anyone in the club knew who, who my old man was and he knew who they were. I'd said to my dad at the time, look, I, I really quite fancy getting into this. I'd love to go and see what they do in, at the Tano in a match day. And he kind of helped me get in there or he set up a meeting with me and, and myself and Jim McSherry, um, who I think at the time was the commercial manager. Anne Clark was working there and Jimmy Clark was, was about as well. So was Bobby Williamson. So it was exciting times. And um, and and from there on, and it kind of just went and, it, and away it went. And I was really lucky to be, to be involved and, and Colin got me in and, I would help out in a match day and I kind of get flung into the deep end be doing announcements and be out on the park and things like that, which was unbelievable. And then um, <laughs> I kind of got myself sacked, actually, which was quite funny because at 14, 15 year old, I'd been there for a couple of years, thought I was the bee's knees, I think maybe 14 or something, maybe 15, had, um, had called actually, I think it was Colin Hargreaves actually, uh, a lot of Kilmarnock fans will know Colin. Um, lovely, lovely guy from down the three towns way, and um, him and I had a fallout on the fans' forums. Shock horror! Somebody has a fallout on the fans' forums, and, uh, and it was Jim McSherry pulled me in and went, "You're, you're done. That's it. Um, you can't can't behave like that." And I thought that was like, okay, fair enough. And I had to go and explain to my dad, and I felt like absolute crap, um, and it just put me in a, a big doubter. And then Colin announced that he was leaving just at the end of the following season, so it was kind of coming up to my yeah, be about sixteen, coming up to my seventeenth birthday. Um, around about then and Colin and a few others had realised that I'd lost my job and they'd put me forward for it and Dave McKinnon by this point was, was at Killy um, and again my, my old man knows David so I think the two of them had maybe had a discussion um, and then David brought me in and, and offered me the job and I was there for I think 10 or 11 seasons and at that point we were quite famed for wind ups and stuff at the time so it was all, it was all really good but it kind of it just sort of escalated and it was, it was really quite cool So Obviously, in two thousand two, what was the club like back then? Because obviously, you know, social media was when it's in its infancy at that point, and um, you know, you didn't have the sort of interaction with the fans that that the club do now. Who were the big faces? And you know, as a Kelly fan yourself, how big an opportunity was that for you to be interacting with with the people that you'd grown up watching? In a sense, it was amazing. Again, I'd been thrown a, I'd been thrown a lifeline to come back into the club that I love and. You know, my dad had always talked about him doing his bit, you know, with the youth development and helping the commercial department outside his job as a bank manager. And so it was my turn, I felt, you know, to do my bit. And then to get this was just an absolute dream job. I was DJing in some of the biggest nightclubs in Scotland at the time. And, and it was just, it was it was just, for me, it was a total career highlight. It was really cool. And big people around the club at the time, Dave McKinnon was there, um, Jim Jeffries was there. It was, it was quite like how it is now. Everyone was just a big family. Everyone knew everyone and they knew who you were. And, 
and they would help out wherever they could. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I was on my own. There was we had the, the, the old electronic scoreboards that are above the Chadwick and the Moffat stands. They are covered up now by the you know the big banners that say what stand they are. But you know, Steve, Stevie Hubble, who's the Hamden scoreboard operator uh, at the time, still is uh, was our scoreboard operator. Um, he's related to the Fleetons, and um, he's such a lovely guy as well. And we got on well, and it was just him and I. So I had to do everything myself. And you know, I would sit in the booth, I would sit in the control room, which is by far the worst view in all of Scott, in fact, all of world football. What I, what I found out was when they built the stadium, you know how we've got the control room and the first aid centre and whatnot, which is in that far corner between the Moffat and the East Stand. Well, there's a side window that wasn't there. They put that in the day of the first game at the stadium. So you couldn't actually see the far end goal from the, the the control room booth that the DJ and the producer and the scoreboard guy were in. And they'd get a window put in especially, and it had literally just finished drying, the silicon and whatnot, by the time we had our first game in there. So that was quite a funny story, but it, it was totally different. I would turn up wearing my strip with Pedro Jr. on the back, um, which was my name on the, on the, on the fans' forums at the time. And it was just, it was my eyes were wide open because you got access like you would never believe. You were getting your players were talking to you, the manager was talking to you, the, the chairman was talking to you, and the time chairman was, was uh, Jamie Moffat, and it was just it was one big family. And then it just kind of a few years later things just started to kind of slide down a little bit. And you know, we all know we all know what happened at various intervals. I remember a game, Fall Cup was the one they hit the post. We played the Great Escape at the end of the game, and I I got into trouble from the police that day. That was quite funny, but. Again, I was quite young and not really given a flying hook, to be fair. You weren't really thinking about your career and longevity and stuff like that as well. So it was it was quite cool, but it was also it was just surreal at the time as well. So what what were your best memories from, from that time, the 2002 to, to 2013? Because the club went through, you know, quite a lot in that time, as you say, escaping from, uh, you know, relegation a couple of times, obviously the the CIS Cup final, uh, which didn't go our way. So obviously there was there's a lot of ups and downs, but but how did it happen from from your point of view of being so close to to the club? It was the, the cup final. That was a sore one. Um, I remember having to rush back down the road. It was snowing as well at some points for that, and I remember running, having to rush back down the road, and we had pyrotechnics sorted, and we had. Like I almost had to, had to leave the game as soon as the final whistle went, and we were determined at the time. Michael was determined at the time that we were going to celebrate something, and the stadium would be open. And but a lot of the players were not keen on it, and we had the, a stage which was painted, and the blue and white paint had started running, and oh, it was just it was just a really really hard thing to take at that point. <coughs> Excuse me, um, that was that was unbelievably low. I, I, you know, the players were very dejected, the, the fans were dejected, it was it just wasn't very good. But then the flip side of that was twenty twelve. You know, we won the, the League Cup, the Scottish Communities League Cup, we won that. Um that was unbelievable. I had Manuel Pascali laughing and, and, and jiving about our county cousins and I had him singing on the stadium microphone as that Moffat stand was absolutely rammed full of supporters and again that was another game I had to I, my girlfriend at the time, her and I were at the game and we had to rush back again to get down before the open top bus and before the parade and stuff like that. And that was just unbelievable. That night was was just crazy. Absolutely. I, again, though, to see it from inside the club, um, it, it used to be very, very difficult for me to take my fan glasses off and switch off from that, which is something I tried to explain to my dad that I can do now. Um, and I think that's because I've worked at Perfect Thistle as well, but at that point, 2012 was just, it was amazing. You, you kind of felt invisible, invincible um, winning that game and the manner in which we did the breakaway and, the, and then Dieter's header was, oh, it was just unbelievable. And I, I don't really think I've ever seen my dad cry quite as much in his life. As, so he's seen us win the league, he's seen us win the Scottish and he's seen us win the League Cup. So he was in tears that day, I was in tears that day and I think every day round about us was in tears that day. But um, I could very much focus on Watching us lift the trophy and then run out the stadium and get down to Rugby Park as, as quickly as I could. Yeah, that's that's one thing that I was I was going to ask because you know when it when it's good times like that, it must be it must be quite hard to to be to be objective as a club employee and not go absolutely cra- crazy like a fan. But 
the flip side of that is when it is, you know, the, the lower points like the the CIS Cup final, does that make it easier then being a club employee rather than a fan in a way because you've got something else to, to focus on, you've got a job to do and it maybe takes your mind off what happened yeah. in a way? I think I think when we, when we got beat in the manner we did in the, the CIS Cup final, I think, yeah, you, you drive down the road and you're coming down the M77, raging, gutted, close to tears, um, really, really emotional, and you're, you're thinking to yourself, what is going on here? But like you say, you almost had to, had to switch that off a little bit and, and try and focus, but that was, I found that extremely difficult. Extremely, I still, I'm not going to lie, I still find it difficult now, even getting beat by Aberdeen. Recently, um, in fact, I've broke about four folders at games against Aberdeen that we've lost, and I, uh, I'd, <laughs> I'd broke my iPad one night as well, again, slamming it off the bench. Um, and it's, it can be very, very difficult. Very, very, very difficult. Um, but you've got to know where the line is as a fan and where the employee starts. There is a lot of, there's a lot of overlap between the two, Adam, but it's sometimes you have to switch that off and you have to be professional and you've got to get the job done. That's ultimately what I do at Comarna because I'm a fan, but first and foremost, I've got a job to do and I, and I need to get that job done as professionally and as well executed as I possibly can. No, oh, absolutely. It's definitely a, a fine line. You know, I, I get that when I'm doing the, the hospital radio for the games. You know, there is, when when you're, when it's good times, it's hard to, to be in that professional setting, but in the, the bad times and, and in the bad games, it can actually make it easier. So uh, I can really understand what you're you're talking about there. So in um, 2013, you went to, to Partick Thistle. That must have been hard you know going from being a Kelly fan and being able to, to to have a license to almost be as enthusiastic about your team as possible to then go into another club um and then having to to try and be really enthusiastic about them um when they're in the the same league and they're sort of competing against Kelly if you will mm. it was very hard um my, my first stint with part or my part of my first Set of jobs with Partick Thistle was just driving their team bus, um, so that was that was at least a little bit of a release I could go and watch. That all came about. I was working for Parts of Hamilton at the time. I'd taken a break from the radio career. I felt that I needed to get some life experience. I've been doing radio since I left school, HBSA, through school, through my exams, through college. I went and I went to college and whatnot, and got qualifications in it and. And I just felt it was time to get a little bit of life experience for the sake of maybe my radio career further down the line, you know, more to talk about, more to be able to understand my audiences and stuff. So I went got a bus licence, worked for Stagecoach, worked for a company called James King, because I was based in Dumfries and Stranraer at the time, and then left, split up with my, my partner at the time and, and came home and started working for Parks, then on to Partick Thistle, they were looking for a bus driver, like a regular team coach driver, and so that was really good. You get close to the players, and it, it's really weird. Like, no, unless you unless you work in football, and unless you've been in the position, I think it's very difficult to get into this mindset. And I still have debates about it with my old man quite a lot. That that you know, Partick Thistle were playing. That was my number one priority. That Saturday was if we were driving away to Ross County or we were away to Stranraer somewhere in the cup, or we were away in Annan or wherever we were, or if we were. The matter where we were away from home, um, my number one priority was the team because I invested a lot of time and effort into making sure they need, got what they needed with the bus. You're getting to know the players, building up a, a rapport and a relationship with everyone. Ian Maxwell included, as he was the managing director at the time, and and you almost kind of you get sucked into that and you become part of the team. And you know they use the bus quite a lot as, as well for for reserve games or development league games and. So you were about the club, you know, two or three days a week. And I then kind of assisted the media team a little bit as well. And so it kind of became not my team. Like, Comalic will always, always, always be my team. And I was always straight on the phone to my dad on a Saturday going, what's going on at Rugby Park? Or what's happening? We're away from home. You know, what, what's going on? And what's happened? And we would talk about that. And then we'd talk about Partick Thistle. And it, it was really strange then. Like, Comalic kind of became secondary because... I wasn't playing for Thistle, but at the end of the day, I was doing my bit for the team, and and that really was my focus on a Saturday, which was really really strange. But you know, I've still got my Kelly strips, I've still got pictures of Rugby Park in my flat, I've still got signed memorabilia, I've still got you know all these sort of things, my collection of strips, and it 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 was just really weird. It, but it's allowed me to come back to Kilmarnock and and be even better than what I was before. 
So when when Kelly played Partick in those years when you were there, how did how did you deal with that? Who were you? Obviously, Partick were your employers, but that must have been quite a, an internal battle for you when they played. Yeah, there was. I was really ill though. Um, one season I was extremely ill. Was was admitted to the hospital. wasn't wasn't well. Um, so there was a couple of times where games that against Kilmarnock I managed to avoid. Well, they didn't actually play each other that much as well, though, because of like top six, bottom six, and, and things like that. But you know, so I managed to avoid it quite a lot of the time. Um, but the one that I did, the one that, that sticks out was the day that you know the, the day after we had, or the day that we had announced Steve Clark as our manager and. Frizzell scores that absolute cracker and, and my dad was in the crowd and he was not far behind me and a lot of Kelly fans, right, obviously they recognise you and, you know, there's a lot of chat and, ah, you're a Kelly fan, you better be shouting our goals, you know, better be really shouting our goals with enthusiasm, big man, and Frizzell scores this cracker and I'm stood in the Colin Muir stand next to the dugout, um, which is something I was quite big on because it means you could chat to the kit man and get ideas of who was going to be coming on and off and we could relay that back to the Jag Zone, which was Partick Thistle's in-house TV channel, like our Kelly TV. So it worked from that, but that was also the away end for when teams came. And quite a bizarre setup, but it works. And I remember Frizzell scores that absolute cracker. And 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 my, my fist was clenched in my pocket, and I was my head was going, you absolute dancer, super, what a goal, Frizz. Amazing. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, hang on, I need to announce this. And it was goal scorer for Kamala, Adam Frizzell. And I had to do it like that. And it just, it felt so wrong, but right at the time, because obviously I'm stood there in a party thistle shirt and tie and suit, and that's who was paying my wages at the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm, the party thistle fans would always call me a tractor driver. That's their thing. It's like everyone from Kamala drives tractors, and it, they would always sing, I'm no Achilles, I'm a jag. And anytime I walk by, any sort of any of the two of the stands, whether it be the Jackie Husband stand or the the, the John Lambie North stand, I would it would be uh, oh there you go you're dirty Kelly whatever and, but it was good banter I had a good rapport with them and I kind of done something there that they had never really done before as well and it was just really cool but uh, games against Kilmarnock were two powder keg for me I'd usually call in sick yeah it's not surprising that that's the game you picked out you just remember that day and obviously Steve Clark was. Yeah. Was announced the day before. You could just you could tell that something was happening. Something was going to happen with this man coming, and um, yeah, a fantastic game and a fantastic goal, as you say. But um, I think you know you you say that you got you got a bit of stick off them, but I assume that they were still they still liked the work you were doing there, and you got on well with the fans and and the players as well. Yeah, I still talk to a lot of I still talk to a lot of party Thistle players or ex players, and I still talk to a lot of fans and. In fact, their their head of media now, um, Graham McRoberts, known as Stato, we kind of coined that uh, nickname, or it kind of got banded about a few times in the team bus um, when Alan Archibald was manager, and and we all just from then on started calling him Stato, and he still called it to this day. But I still have a good relationship. I've got a relationship with a lot of people at different clubs across Scotland, having been on the team buses and whatnot, and capacity with the BBC and other stuff that I do. Then you know you get to know a lot of people. Scottish football is a very small industry. You know, everyone knows everyone. You really can't burp or fart without somebody at a club. You know, you could do something down here and before you know it, the guys at Ross County know everything that's happened. And that's how small it is. But it's a great industry to work in. And I still talk to the likes of Stevie Lawless, who's a phenomenal player at Livingston now, and Callum Booth, who's at St Johnston, and he went to Dundee United and as well. And Chris Doolan and I are, are good pals. Like We kind of not quite so much grew up together, but we played in opposite teams um, through schools. At the time as well, like we, Steve, well, Stephen Naismith was in my class at school, and he was uh, he was just a phenomenal. He was the phenomenal. He was the difference between us winning and losing trophies. To be fair, it certainly wasn't my goalkeeping attributes. So being played as a striker now and again by Mister Thompson and Mister Collins, who are both Kilmarnock supporters, and um, it was it was just phenomenal. And but I still talk to a lot of these guys. I've still got really good relationships, and you would never rule out going back to work at the likes of Partick Thistle. You would never rule out going to work at a another club in the country you really wouldn't you just you just don't know what's around the corner but you know it's, it's good I think it's good practice to have good friends inside Scottish football um, you know it's it's mean there's Stephen O'Donnell's best mate in Scottish football is Mikey Devlin in Aberdeen you would never think that you just you just wouldn't think that as well so uh, Sean Wilson his best pal is Lee Irwin so again you would never really think that as well so um, it's it's 
Scottish football is strange. It works in mysterious ways. But as an industry, I, I certainly I certainly love working in it and having relationships, like I say, with, with people at other clubs is, is good. But let's like say Graham and I at, at, at Thistle are, are very tight. Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, as fans forget how small Scottish football actually is compared to a lot of leagues um, around Europe and around the world. Is it, the, the number of employees that a club has, for example, is actually quite small compared to what you get in the, the Premier League and such. So it's no surprise that, um, you know, people like yourself and the players have, you know, make good friends um, around the league as they're going on. Um, but you started your, your second spell with Kelly in October 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously that was the same month that, that Steve Clark arrived at the club which one do you think the, the Kelly fans were happier about which signing do you think they, they were more excited about well you know it's absolutely he hot to do with Steve Clark I'm not going to lie I finished my career at Partick Thistle as a top six announcer and then I went on to continue to be a top six announcer at, uh, at Rugby Park so um, yeah Steve Clark knows nothing it's all down to me no I'm joking that's not fair on the gaffer um, I think I think everyone's more delighted with Steve. Listen, at the end of the day, I'm just a guy that reads the teams and I'm that gob and a stick that we spoke about at the top of the at the top of the programme and it's what I call myself on the podcast because that's what I am. I shout, we are Kelly, I announce the teams, I announce some goal scorers and just try and add a little bit of atmosphere. But at the end of the day, football is football and you're there to win the games and Steve Clark is by far probably one of the best, the best signing that the club has ever made and it's probable in its history. Give or take the likes of Davy Sneddon with his header and stuff like that, you know, signing him. I think certainly modern day football, you know, that's olden day football, but uh, given modern day football, it's Steve Clark, everyone would be, you know, Gavin Who, that show business. It's all about Steve Clark. So, um, one, one of the first things you did almost exactly when you came back was that, as you say, the We Are Killy uh, chant that you do at the start of every game. It's fair to say that I think that revolutionised the start of every game in the way that, you know, it gets the fans going straight away, um, generates a bit of atmosphere and, and gets the fans together. How did that come about? And did you think it that it was going to be as popular as it's proven to be amongst the fans? Well, we used we used something similar at Thistle. We used We Are Thistle and it was something that we had uh, developed at Partick Thistle. A lot of teams like to use the hashtag We Are, but there never seems to be any sort of identity with it. And so we made up the the kind of war cry at Partick Thistle, and it worked there because they they're actually Partick Thistle fans are really up for a party. They're they're really they are phenomenally amazing fans, and um, they do this German shout out, which is something I would love to do at Rugby Park. We never managed to implement it during the time of Sir Steve, but they do the shout out where if somebody say it was Chris Doolan scored, I would come on and go goal scorer for Thistle number nine Chris, and they would go Doolan, and then we'd repeat that two more times. I would love to do that at, at Kelly. Um, but it needs to be when the time's right, you know, when we're... It's almost if you do these things, we need to be winning games to introduce new things. Yeah. But it was a new dawn, it was a new era, it was a new beginning at Kilmarnock when Steve took over. And we had We Are Kelly, hashtag We Are Kelly, plastered everywhere in the club. It was on social media. Chris Kyle was our head of media at the time, or just literally before I came back, Chris was the head of media. And then Scott McClymont came in and, Chris was still doing a lot of work in the media department as he was uh, the first team analyst, which he still is just now. And so the two of them were working really closely. I worked with them and, and we all three of us sat down and we kind of come up with this. I went, look, boys, this is what we've done at Thistle. This is how really good it is. Showed them some videos of it. I said, I think we should be doing this here. And we sat down with uh, with Kirsten uh, Robertson, the then chief executive of the club. And she just went, yeah, go for it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I said, well, we need to probably give it six months at least to we see how it goes. And I remember doing it against Tabernay that night, Halloween. What a night that was. I think that was my, was my first game back at Kelly. I was still working for the two. I was actually doing the two clubs at the time. And that night, I would get beat. We all know the result. But to see a team get clapped off the park, having been you know, blown away, was just unbelievable. Um we tried it that night. People didn't really catch on then, which I didn't expect them to. But a lot of people were taken aback as well by the fact that I turned up in a suit. had a club suit on that night, shirt and tie, waistcoat, the lot, radio on, people talking in my ear. And I think there was there was somebody actually put something on Facebook that night or the following night going, things must things are definitely changing in Kilmarnock. Even the announcer is wearing a suit. And, you know, that's something that sticks out in my head is... It was just bringing another level of professionalism to it. We did it at Partick Thistle, and you know there was no reason not to do that at Kilmarnock. I totally changed the setup at Kelly, and Chris Woods was working with me at at Partick Thistle. Chris, that we spoke about earlier on, and 
he came back to Kelly. He's kind of grown up a Kelly fan, and so is his boy and his little girl. And so we kind of almost took the template of what we did at Thistle, and we were able to do it on a bigger scale at Kilmarnock. And that's where the We Are Kelly um, phrase came from, like the war cry before. And the more games we started playing well and winning, the bigger the crowds became and, and the easier it became. So I really have to thank Sir Steve, to be honest, for that. I have to, I have to thank Steve because and the players because the way that they were going about their business meant what I did off the park or what I did in the build-up and at half time and stuff just made it a million times easier. Had we been, you know, had we been, had we stayed where we were and had we been in a playoff place and fighting relegation, then it would have worked. I've got no doubt it would have worked, but it would have taken a little bit longer for people to, to really get on board. But the fact we were winning really, really, really helped that. So I've got to thank the players and I've got to thank Steve and Alex for delivering that on the park. Otherwise, it would have been a lot harder for me. Is it fair to say that in the space of the four years that you were away, there was a big change in the sort of professionalism around the club? As you say, you know, you you, you left when you were wearing your strip with the nickname on the back and you, you came back and you started wearing the suit. And obviously you had a, you had a team around you as well when you came back to, to help you out. So it seems like there was a big shift towards, you know, trying to, trying to be collectively together as a club in the way that things worked and not just be, you know, sort of individual ideas here and there coming together yeah I think that was that was certainly the plan I had been talking to come on up for a while about coming back um, I remember coming down actually to get a, we, we launched one of the strips and Chris Kyle had actually put me on camera I was working at Capital FM at the time so he was like oh Capital DJ Capital FM DJ and it was like okay calm down but it was funny um, and it was not long after that that there was chat about coming back and Chris and I then at that point became really tight and good friends as well and we, we still remain best of friends now and he, he's a, a lovely guy, but at that point, I think things were starting to change. You could see it in our media output. You could see we were starting to align with how other clubs were going about their business more professionally. I think at that point as well, the club was still quite unsure about social media. And bear in mind as well, we were a one-man board at one point, you know, before Billy Bowie really stepped up to the plate. And it was it was talking to me, Billy, actually. That was what got all of this back. As I came in to see Kirsten, but... Billy's a, a family friend of my dad and my dad actually was his bank manager for years and that's how they know each other. And again, I think there'd been a bit of chat and I went down to Billy's offices, his HQ at Moorfield and, and had a chat and he asked me to outline everything that we were doing, excuse me, at Partick Thistle. And I said, look, for me, this is how it's got to be now. We can't be, you know, we can't be the same class. The times have, times have changed. People like a wind-up. But again, I was thinking of my career and thinking about you know, being taken seriously and, and things like because people still at one point, okay, Patrick Thistle really helped with that, but I was still knowing in some places as the wind up announcer from Kilmarnock that would play the hokey cokey for the Celtic huddle, and which I think there's still a clip of that on YouTube somewhere, to be fair. But um, times had changed, the club had moved on. Steve Clark's coming in, you know, with this uber professionalism about him, this, this massive air of importance and, and pedigree that is Steve. And I thought we had to do the same. You know, the suits worked for me. I thought, you know, you can't be walking about trackside or sitting behind the bench in a killy top and jeans and trainers. It just, for me, it just didn't set off the right vibe. It didn't set off the right vibe for me as a, as a presenter, as an announcer, as a worker. And it, it certainly, I don't think, would have set off set off the right vibe to the fans as well. And you probably get taken a bit more seriously in a shirt and a tie. And it just helped. I think it just helped. And, it, and at that point, Obviously, we went through the troubles with, with Michael Johnson and whatnot, but by this point now, I've come back and Billy's on the board and Billy had outlined a lot of things to me behind the scenes that were going to happen. I was in a fortunate position to be put in that. And then Billy asked me what I wanted and I explained that I wanted a new sound system for the stadium. I wanted this, that and the next thing I would progressively like us to get to this stage, that stage and that stage to allow us to do our job to enhance the match day experience. And eventually, we got there with that and, and it was come back. And then I, I signed my contract, quote unquote, as it were, and come back to the club, and I was absolutely buzzing. You were saying there that you, you were trying to be more professional and, and being taken more seriously, and I think generally, you know, that is what was happening with the club in general. But um, you know, there was the, the one stunt with the the fireman's hat um, <laughs> after the game against Celtic. How, obviously, that's I think that's one of the things that Kelly fans perhaps know you know you best for. How did that? come about and why did you decide to to do that after you say you know trying to be so professional um in in the months before why did why suddenly um did that come up again 
Well, I, I like. Don't get me wrong. I think there is a there is a way to there is a there's a way to there's a way to do these stunts, classy, professional, but also have a nice dig at the same time. And you look at what the players are doing on social media. You look at maybe what that that particular week, where obviously we had drawn with Celtic and Brendan Rodgers had called us a bunch of firefighters or, or said that a bunch of firefighters could do a lot better or could do the same job, accusing us of parking the bus and putting the fire engine in between the defence and whatnot, which was just sour grapes from Brendan. Let's be honest, yeah. because he didn't. Excuse me, he didn't get what he wanted out of that. So the reason that came about was because of what Gary Dicker and, and what everyone was saying. Sorry, you can hear that I'm I'm currently sat in my veranda and one of my neighbours has just come back. But um, at that point, so Gary Dicker was saying stuff that um, a lot of players were saying stuff on Twitter as well. So it kind of became a, right, do you know what? Hearts had this big disliking at the time. The Hearts fans had this big disliking at the time for Celtic. I spoke to Alan Kyle, our support liaison officer, who was good friends um, with a couple of firemen. And then they gave us a hat and I thought, well, let's just go on with a hat at half time. And, and see what happens. And it was a good laugh and it was well received. I actually was my Facebook profile picture for a while and it was just one of those kind of, Gary Gary he said he would come out and do the halftime draw. So Gary actually walked out to do the halftime draw to the, the Fireman Sam theme tune, <laughs> which was quite funny. He said he wouldn't wear the helmet, but he'd be more than happy to walk out to Fireman Sam. So that was quite funny. Uh, so uh, another big, uh, you know, new part of the, the agenda at the club has been Kelly TV. Obviously you do the, the commentary for for the away games. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's been several highlights of that over the over the course of the last couple of years, particularly Hearts away. Can you just talk about that a wee bit? Because you know, even even today, even in the last week or so, that that that's come up again with the the club putting a couple of things out, and that's that's obviously gone down uh, extremely well with the fans. <laughs> yeah, I actually believe it or not, uh, Steve Clark's son um, had tweeted about that the other day as well, going needing cheering up just shoot with his tweet and then it was the a link back to me losing my head and it's it was one of those ones like did that goal come in the 86th minute if i remember correctly yeah. and it was that was i think that was maybe another turning point of ours late on in that season anyway is that the, the god i just it was so full our end was full we'd saw that allocation it was you know i was getting videos from friends and whatnot and and fans that were inside that that away end and it looked amazing my best mate, in fact, John Boyd, who's now one of our co-commentators at Kelly, he was in that end with his dad at the time. I had a, you know, a lot of the, a lot of different Kelly fans were, were tweeting us pictures and videos from that day, you know, in the build-up. And it was one of those ones you're chasing, we're chasing Europe. Now, to give you a bit of background, Steve and I had agreed, and Alex had agreed that there would be no European chat, no Europa League chat whatsoever in any of the post-match interviews or anything we did pre-match. And that was an agreement we had. I wrote a kind of document of going, right, guys, this is what I want Kelly TV to be like. Scott and I sat down, worked out a couple of things, along with Chris, and I went and sat and and, and, and gave it to Steve Clark, and Steve was more than happy with that, and he's like, this is perfect. We're not talking about Europe. And I went, I'm not interested in talking about Europe just now, Gaffer. It's, it literally is as cliche as it sounds, game at a time. And that's how that came about. So there was this build-up, but it goes back to being a supporter, Adam. There was this build-up of... You know, Europe is there. This is the first time in like eighteen years we could be in Europe. You know, going going somewhere in Europe with my dad, but also at the same time going with the club, and it was like, oh my god, and it was so nip and tuck. It was so close. You remember how tight it was at the time as well. You know that top four, top five was was really tight. Anything really could have happened. And I remember the but it was a corner from Buck, and then it came out, and Malumbu had a chance. It was Dicker played it in. Malumbu got it. Malumbu feigned the shot, and I thought he was going to shoot. Now, as you know, as a commentator, you're kind of thinking, you know, half a second in front of the move, and you're watching the game, trying to work out what the next move's going to be, but you're also thinking about what you're saying and stuff like that as well. So I did that, thought Malumbu was going to shoot. Malumbu cuts back on his right foot to his left, plays it across, and at that point, Dicker gets it. And I thought Dicker, I thought Gary had a, had a great chance to shoot. And at that point, I'm a, it just came out. It 110% just came out. What's going on? Just shoot. And then it felt with Stuart Finlay. And I don't really need to say any more about that. Stuart Finlay and I have had a good bit of banter about that on the on the We Are Kelly podcast and and and, it, and we have good banter about it and about the club when we see each other, but it was my emotions got the better of me, which as a commentator you should probably never do. Certainly if you're doing it for the BBC or or any of the any of the kind of big networks, you'd never do that. But um 
it's club TV, so it has to be skewed towards the club. Oh, it's not propaganda, but it's, you know, everything has to be really skewed. Our, our, our idea of Killy TV is it has to sound BBC quality, you know, BBC professionalism, but at the same time, we're a club TV channel, so there has to be a lot of bias towards Killy. But equally, if we're playing rubbish, we will describe that we are playing rubbish. You know, you don't you don't ever pull the, the wool over the fans' eyes. If we're playing crap, we're playing crap. And we will describe that action. Not a problem, because that's what the fans want to hear, how good or how bad it is. And then that happened at, at Tyne Castle. And we were, we were the better team that day. We were by far the better team. And then it falls to Finlay. And as Alan Corkin said in the commentary, that ball was still accelerating when it hit the back of the net. And we were jumping about. I cracked my nose off the screens in front of us in the commentary box. Alan did the same. Andy Barnes did the same. Scott McClymont was up on his feet. I think Neil Hobson was with us by that point as well. So we were all Lachlan from the standard. They sat just along from us and we were going crazy. And all the Hearts directors sat right behind me. We were all looking down. The whole of that new main stand was looking down and all I could feel was just the eyes. I didn't care. I turned around and all I could see was our directors going absolutely tonto. It was great. I suppose that comes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, you're trying to be professional, but in those moments, the fact that you're you're a fan first and foremost just takes over. I know that, you know, from from my own personal experience doing the the hospital commentary, we we've had that a couple of times. Yeah. Um, the Rangers game recently, where Brophy scored, uh, last <laughs> couple of minutes, we had that, and um, you know, sometimes you just can't help it, and I think the fans appreciate that in a way. Um, perhaps more well, than, than just the sort of semi-neutral commentary. They appreciate that you are a fan first and foremost and they want to see the club officials, if you will, being just as passionate as they are. Of course they do. The good thing is now, though, at Kelly is the vast majority of us behind the scenes, believe it or not, are Kilmarnock supporters. Scott McClymont's grown up as a, an avid Kilmarnock fan. Him and his dad um, used to go, obviously, his, his dad passed away not long ago but before that him and his dad and his brother would go all around the country supporting Kelly so he's a huge Kilmarnock fan I'm a huge Kilmarnock fan Chris Kyle's a massive Kilmarnock fan Neil Hobson not so much he's a jambo but Kilmarnock fan he he gets what we're talking about earlier on about switching switching off to being a, 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 a supporter of a, you know switching off from your first team yeah. so he he almost he wants us to do well all the time you know the girls that work in the finance team, all of them are Kilmarnock fans as well. And, you know, even Greg McEwen, who is, is not the most of avid football fans, the head of commercial and marketing and brand, he's a huge Kelly fan now. Was always always interested in Kilmarnock, but in Billy Bowie, who, let's be honest, massive Kilmarnock fan. Yeah. Kathy Jameson, massive Kilmarnock fan. You know, Margaret Wilson that does all the pies, that, that's the head of Max Day Catering, massive Kilmarnock fan. It's Jim Wilson's wife. You know, so it's Chris Woods. Kilmarnock fan. I'm, I'm trying to think of anyone inside the club really that isn't a Kilmarnock fan. Yeah, that that must know? be so so beneficial to have so many people that actually care so much about the club. Because although you yeah. may not, you may not like to think it, surely being a fan of the club will will make you work better in a way. If you if you get what I mean. Not that I'm saying that the people that don't support the club aren't as passionate, but that it must just give that extra little level to the work that they're doing. That you know they're doing it for everyone else but also for themselves as well yeah at the end of the day you're a you're a Kilmarnock fan so your your work is you know you, you your work is to Kilmarnock fans you're a Kilmarnock fan like you say your work is for you and the club and you always think of the best you always think for that you always think the best case for the club you always think what what can I do best for the club here and that's what everyone does you know our, our new club secretary Karen Costello she's she's not a Kilmarnock fan but she's worked in the she worked in the SFA, I think, for 34 years, but now has been sucked in and said it's unbelievable how special a club it is. You know, you look at Ross Matty, legend, absolute legend. He says that, that you know you cut him open, it'll blow it's blue that comes out of him. You know, it's Paul McDonald, head of the academy, is the same. You'll hear that he had a, a really good football career as well. You've got like to Gary Hay that's still coach at the club and even Andy Gardner, who's the, the new women's coach that was at Rangers, he grew up, I'm sure he said he grew up as a Rangers fan, but has been completely sucked in to, to Kilmarnock in the way of the of the way of the club and the ethos and the and the, the fact that we want to do everything right and stand by our fans and stand by our staff and our players and do the right thing. You know, Kilmarnock are a classy club. I'm not saying that because A, I work for them and B, I'm a fan. Kilmarnock have always been a classy club. 
but now we're just a class above. Like we are, you know, we do the right thing, we do it the right way. We, you know, from a, a moral stance and a, an ethical stance and just the right way. That is that is how Kilmarnock go about their business. The same way that Billy Bowie goes about his business with his tankers. The same way Cathy Jameson goes about her business and the same way Phyllis McLeish goes about her business. And so that filters from the top down, you know. But like you say, because we're all fans, we all want to do even more. Like we go, like people don't understand, I think at times, the work that we put in in the media department. Like after a game, <clears throat> excuse me, after a game, you know, we've got our Kelly TV stuff to do. So we've got to organise who goes and does the Sunday papers, who goes and does the daily papers, who goes and does the press conference, who goes and does the radio, who goes and does the telly. You know, you've got all of that to work out. And then you've got to remember somebody needs to come and do Kelly TV along with Alex Dyer. And so that can be, that's a lot in that. That takes up an hour and a half, more or less, after the game. So you've got, that's an hour and a half after the half hour, because by the time they get in, they get, you know, they're, they're kind of um, debrief, as it were, or their, their talk and their team talk after the game. Then they get changed. The players are so slow sometimes. So that maybe half an hour, 30, 40 minutes, and then they've got all their media commitments on top of that. And then they've got us, and then we've got to edit the interviews, and then we've got to put out the promos, and then we've got to write up the match report, and then we've got to get the full game from Chris or the broadcaster, and then we've got to edit that down to highlights. And then, you know, sometimes we can be there on a, on a three o'clock kickoff. We're there to nine, ten, ten o'clock at night. If it's a midweek game, we're there to one and two in the morning. You know, it's, you know, but you put in that extra effort to make it as best as we can because. We're Kilmarnock fans, and we want we want Kilmarnock fans to engage and love what we do. No, absolutely, and you know, as a Kilmarnock fan, as we said earlier, uh, the highs are even higher, and the the lows even lower, unfortunately. And um, takes us nicely onto the the Europa League. Um, obviously, you you went down to to roll in the. the <laughs> I'll talk about the first leg. That'll be the good part. Um, we went down. You went down to Rill in the the monster truck, of course, and yeah. um, you were doing wee bits for for Kelly TV in and around the the pubs where the Kilmarnock fans were. Just you know, describe that. You know, because for me, you know, that was the first time that we've been in the Europa League in my lifetime. And oh wow, yeah, um, of course. Just just seeing that, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get a, t- a ticket for for Wales, unfortunately. But just seeing that, you know, it's just you just realise how big a club and come on a car and how passionate the fans are when they sort of take over a, a whole town in another country just describe it from from your point of view obviously being quite a, a focal point for the fans when you when you turned up in that monster truck at, at the pub how did that you know what were your experiences down there well, it was like I'm not, it's, I, i've been lucky enough to see Kilmarnock in the, the cup winners cup uefa cup yeah you know, i went to kaiser's out and i was the fortunate position that my dad took took me over there was a group of us went there um, and I, I've watched us in Europe before. I've been privileged to see that. You know, there was there was there was a, a time in my life, <clears throat> first of all, where Kilmarnock in Europe was the norm, and that was kind of after I got that was that was <laughs> that was around about the time where I fell out with Colin Hargreaves. So I wasn't at the club, but I was. It was still you know there was that time there. You know, you're talking the two, early two thousands where people like Freddie Dindaloo were playing for us, and what a defender he was. And Christoph Kokard at the club. So we were in Europe on a regular basis then. So I kind of got used to that. And then to be back there again was amazing. Actually, the, the, the Monster Trucks had been down in England before I got there. They'd been down in England, um, Boston, or just outside Boston. Um, so kind of near Grantham. Um, they'd been away getting serviced from an American truck provider that, that Billy does a lot of work with. So they had been down on low loaders. So I had to get the train down the day before the game. Or two days, or the day before the game, I got the train down, and it was really early in the morning. Like I left, I must have been one of the first Kilmarnock fans to leave Ayrshire. I was, uh, I was, I was in, the, I was. Oh, I think my train left Central at seven o'clock. I got, a, I think I got a lift up actually from my my neighbour Amy. She gave me a lift to work in the morning, and then I went in and in, in the train station and went down, and was on the train all the way down, and then. The lines got closed. The track was kind of the worst day possible. It was roasting hot. I'm in a Kelly tracksuit as well, remember? So, you know, people are going, eh, what? Who? Who are Clark? What are you? Oh, yeah, Steve Clark. Yeah, we know Kelly. So the whole way down, that was hilarious. And then I, I had to get a taxi, which the Virgin Trains put on. Um, there had been a, a train broke down further down the line. and um, There had been points for was at London and all sorts. It was a nightmare. So it was a bit later getting to a company called Clyde Shore Trucking, 
picked up the monster truck at the train station at Grantham and then drove across, literally drove from the east coast of the UK all the way over to North Wales. And the one thing I remember was I took a break, I had to go and get some fuel, and I took a break and I went on my Snapchat. And you know how on Snapchat it comes up with like the heat map? Yeah. Right, so there was this heat map that was the same journey that I had taken. I'm like, what's going on here? And I hit all these different people's heat maps, and it was the monster truck driving by them. People in England were Snapchatting our monster truck, going all the way over, which was just hilarious. And then I got to the team hotel, and met up uh, with the team. And so that was amazing. So the first funny story, so that's the first one. Then the second one was the, the hotel receptionist got my room mixed up. So Massimo Donati and I had room across from each other. And... She gave me a key to Massimo Donati's room and, and hadn't realised that they had somehow been switched. So I get to the hotel, was absolutely shattered because I've been on the go since like five in the morning, been up for my breakfast at Yon Time, had driven, train all the way down, then driven across the, the breadth of the UK to get to where we were staying. And I then goes and chucked my bag in this bed and tripped up over Massimo's trainers. And I'm like, oh, what the heck? So I goes back, oh, sorry, we've given you Massimo Donati's key by accident. The room's got swapped, blah, blah, blah. I ended up in my own room, that's fine. And then that night, we decided to go around the pubs. And that was awesome. We were playing with the horn, like hitting the horn, doing the Kelly chants. And like the police came up to us and they were loving it. Uh, locals were coming out, loving it. Connors Key fans were following us about. The videos were galore. It was just, it was, it was just surreal. And it was amazing to be doing my bit and playing my part. For Kelly in Europe, and I met up. Obviously, my mum and dad were they were down on holiday. They had tailored their holidays well. When I say they, my dad had kind of tailored the holiday, much to the annoyance of my mum. But um, I had to turn up at their hotel and pick my dad up in the monster truck and take him into town. And <laughs> it was quite funny, to be fair. And then we met up with friends, and then I took my dad back and then picked him up the next day for the game and brought him into the town. Um, and then left him, and he would be he was drinking with his friends and drinking with people that he knows, and then. At that point, Scott McClymont said to me, look, I'm far too busy. You're going to have to commentate this game yourself tonight. No, not a chance, Scott. He's like, find a, find a, find a co-commentator and we, we'll sort everything else out. So then after that, that's where John Boyd then became involved in Kelly. Uh, it's, if anyone can help me through this as a co-commentator, he'd, John is a, a branch manager, a general manager for the Scottish Building Society. So he's never done any broadcasting in his life. But it was the first person I could think of and the first person I knew that was in Wales. He was there with his dad. So John then came on and was our co-commentator. And the UEFA match delegate was sat next to us the whole game and he thought it was hilarious. And the guy was lovely. Um, a guy called Mark Pittman, who's from the Welsh FA as well as UEFA. And it was just great fun. It was just it was, it was was just an experience that was out of this world. And Kilmarnock fans were trying to kind of encroach into every single bit of that stadium and roll as they possibly could. And it was just amazing. I we had fans come onto the pitch and you don't really want to see that but emotions spill over but you still shouldn't do that but the emotions that day was was unbelievable to, to score the winner of the manner which we did was just unbelievable and it was I, I remember it like it was yesterday and I want it again Is it fair to say that that's your, your best memory of your in your second spell at the club or is there something else that's you know, you've enjoyed as much? There's, there's quite a few. A lot of them down to Steve. Was the the day, the final game of the season against Rangers. Oh, what a game. Phenomenal. Um, and invited some people down to the game as well because I wanted them to see it. Um, and they were in the Moffat stand. And and then obviously I, I caught wind or was told roughly that, that Steve's farewell speech would be emotional. Um, and I, was, I, I spoke with Scott McClymont about it. And we both agreed that we would tell BT Sport very limited information um, about this. So therefore, we then plugged, effectively plugged the stadium sound system into the, into the telly, as it were. So we had to run cables over the top of the control room into the outside broadcast truck. And that was then one of my highlights. Is And I nearly burst into tears, actually, because I knew what was coming. I knew exactly what was happening. And I knew the whole story. I knew that... I just knew everything that was going on. And... I, when you watch, if you if I watch back the interview again, you know the one where he says bye bye Rangers, bye bye Celtic, this is my trophy, you know this sort of thing. Everyone here is I get banned from saying Sir Steve. Like obviously we please welcome Sir Steve Clark every time he walked out the tunnel. 
he banned Sir Steve. Um, it all happened after a game against St Mirren. A journalist had said something, and Steve went, "Oh, that's just Gav. He's a bit over eager." And there was a bit of banter. So, and uh, Steve is so dry, but so nice. Such a family man as well as Steve Clark, and uh, lived for his grandson. Absolutely lived for his grandson. And um, so, so after the game, BT had tried to get Ailey Barber to do this, and we point blank. I put my foot down. Absolutely. And I'm not usually one for being an arse. Some people are probably telling I am, but um, I put my foot down and told BT, absolutely under no circumstances is any of your staff coming on that park unless it's a cameraman. And Scott McClymont backed it up as well. We'll do this. This is our party. We'll do it our way. We do it our way or you can bugger off. And I, I just, assume you knew that that was going to be a huge moment professionally for you as well. Yeah. With, you knew that you know a lot of, a lot of eyes were going to be on you from... Like from the Kelly fans and from from, the, the, from the BT cameras as well, exactly. You know, there's there's huge interest in Kilmarnock and Steve Clark at that time, and you yeah, you would have like, to say there's probably hundreds of thousands of people have watched that. Millions, that's millions, millions have watched that that speech over the the last couple of years, was, and it was huge. It was it was surreal because it's probably a career highlight, not just my second time at Kilmarnock, but a lifetime highlight. That my dad was in the stand. There was people on the ground that I wanted to be in the ground to see this as well. And especially my dad. But to to be able to interview Steve live on BT, I mean, BT knew, the guys at BT, I know them really well at Sunset and Vine, and they, they know what I've done with Ladbrokes and they know what I've done with the BBC, so they were quite happy for this. So to get that opportunity, first and foremost, I can't thank them enough. It was amazing. But to right before it, I go, so, so Steve, and I put my head down. And at that point, that's when you know anyone that knows me really well. My head goes down if I'm, that's me trying to buy myself, you know, half a second. To, I had to compose, like my voice was wavering. And and then obviously I mentioned about him when he grew up in the three towns. And he starts smiling and laughing. And he kind of he kind of just looked at me and mouthed, you know, mouthed a couple of things to me, which I'm, I'm, I don't ever want to say. But, um, and then he went on and said what he was going to say. And it was just amazing to be able to do that and do that in front of the cameras and have pictures of that and, and stuff. Do you know one thing I don't actually have is anything Kelly signed by Sir Steve. No, that's a lie. I've got a ball that's signed by Sir Steve, but it wasn't actually me that got that. I think we, we won that at a supporter's night. Um, when my dad got it. He won it in a raffle and he gave it to me. But um, the one thing I regret was not asking Steve to sign something for me. But again, it's going over that professional line. I've got a picture. I had a picture with him and Alex in the standard, and which is amazing. But that that's probably that probably sticks up there as as one of the most amazing things I've probably ever done in my career. I've not had a yeah. I've had a really I've had a good shot in my career. I really have. I've been really lucky with some of the things I've done, the places I've worked, and the people I've worked beside. You know, I'm not I'm not famous by any matter of means, but I've had a slightly d- different job from everyone else. And it's something I'm passionate about, but it's just that I, I still think about it, and now and again you watch it back, and I, I cry now if I watch it. I feel myself welling up because I know who's in the stadium. I know who I know. My dad's there, and I know that that's a memory that will last forever. And I was lucky that my dad was there, and you know that it was just amazing. I don't get me wrong, being stood next to my dad would have been immense, but then I wouldn't have got that. Yeah, do you know and. I'd like to think that he was proud to know that our best manager in, in history, and I'm the one that gets to interview him at the end of his tenure, knowing that he's going to Scotland, and you're like, no way, man. It was just unbelievable. And then later that night, we went to the, the Football Writers Awards in Glasgow, the Scottish Football Writers Awards, and Steve was sat just over from us, as was Billy. I was at a BBC table with John Barnes, and Chris Kyle came with me, and... That was just surreal that night as well because obviously Steve was picking up prize. He's left, right, and centre. Um, and then it was the Monday it got announced that he was he was going to Scotland. But I've bleated on probably too much there. Uh, but we could we could talk about Steve Clark forever, and it I think was, it would just become a a Steve Clark appreciation podcast, which we've done plenty of um, over the years. So um, it, it, it was just amazing, absolutely, utterly amazing, and. I'll forever be thankful to the club for allowing me to come back and get that moment. We never knew that would happen. Excuse me, sorry. We never knew that was going to happen. You can never predict the future, but to have the opportunity to have been able to come back to Kilmarnock 
and then be there and witness that. And from a personal point of view, from a fan point of view, from a professional a professional point of view, is it just blows me away every time I think about it. No, absolutely. Um, I was, you'd have to say that, you know, when when times are good and when the team are doing good, it makes it easier to to do things off the pitch as well. And that's where we come on to the 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 We Are Kelly podcast, obviously, which has been a huge new introduction to the the club as well. Um, what what's it like doing that, um, and what's it like getting that insight into into the players that you know not not many clubs have that. You know they've got they've got bits and pieces here and there, but they don't have a podcast where it's just about the players and about their life and and what they're doing and how they're feeling out with football. It's amazing. It's something that Scott Neil and I had spoke about, especially when Neil Hobson came on board as our uh, media assistant, um, who, by the way, at nineteen years old does a phenomenally good job. A wealth of experience of him up to Glasgow Warriors and whatnot before as an intern and various other places. Neil is Neil is really good. The thing I love about Neil is. He is a kind of millennial, if you wish. He looks at things... I mean, I'm old hat now. I'm 33, 34 this year, come August. I'm an old man now. And uh, so Scott and I are not far off the same age. Chris is a wee bit behind us. And, and Neil, is, Neil is the young media lackey, as he likes to call himself. But So we all we all work really well together. Scott, Neil and I in that podcast are, I think, a really good team. Um, but we wanted to do something when the time was right. We wanted to do something when the relationship between the three of us was really starting to blossom. Um, and that's what we've done and we all know the parts that we play in the podcast and it's really good it's just amazing it's just it's just an, you know what it is it's an, ex, it's an extension of us at work that's all it is it's an extension of us at work talking to the players because we have this we, ha- we have this um, relationship with the players Adam that you know we can all talk to each other we all we all rip the mick out of each other and we all we all have a good laugh. The players, every one of them, approachable. Every one of them, good crack. Um, and that comes through on the podcast. And obviously, we, we sat down and so Scott and Neil wanted to bring me on board with that as well because of the experience I've got. You're talking 15, 16 years now in professional radio, you know, professional broadcasting. And I was abundantly clear that you know these are the things that we need to do. So Scott said that he wanted from it. Neil said that he wanted. And then I'm like, well, look, we need we need these furniture pieces like the podcast pub quiz like Spotify Roulette um, and those are the things as well that really allow us to get into to get into the I mean you listen to Steve if you haven't listened to Stephen O'Donnell the music on his phone is <laughs> it's just it's hilarious our nursery rhymes come up so it is really random you'll hear we've got another podcast dropping this Friday coming what date's this Friday then that'll be well, I don't know end of uh, still the start of April 10th, I suppose I think, Friday, yeah, yeah. So Friday, 10th of April, we've got another one dropping. Yeah, 10th of April, Good Friday. Um, we've got another one dropping. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but um, it will certainly assist you in uh, your lockdown listening. Um, and it's a really good one. But his music choices are so unbelievable suspect, but it goes to show how random it is. And that's, you know, it's things like that, that that people want to know. That people want to know about the player. They want to know about their career. They want to know what they think about the club. You know, again, because we're all fans, give or take, Neil. Um, but because we're all we're all supporters, especially Scott and I, we, we know what the fans want to hear. You know, we just want to sit down, make it a chat. It's not an interview. It's just it's just four guys, four microphones, you know, shooting the breeze and talking about one guy's career and his time at Kilmarnock and, and ups and downs of his, his personal life, his, um, his professional career, his professional life and stuff that makes them tick and I think the music and is really good for that as well because we all everyone loves music. And then the pub quiz, the podcast pub quiz is just great. Is you know, Catman Kev was horrendous. He spent twelve seconds trying to work out advantage and and Stephen O'Donnell is uh, is isn't much better, I hasten to add, but um, our next podcast guest uh, isn't actually much better either. But hmm. Well it's funny that you mentioned the pub quiz because you're very quick to to rip on the players, but I was wondering if you would, if you would like to be up for your own pub quiz and uh, find out how find out how well you will do, um, just so that you're not so quick to judge everybody else. Um, I've got ten questions prepared. If you're up for it, um, well, is it are we doing this in thirty seconds? Oh, we can as long as you take, as long as you want to take. Um, no, but they're not they're not too difficult. But um, just to see if it's as easy as you make out to be I, on I the am podcast. Not go- 
I'm not going to lie here. I am absolutely terrified now. <laughs> absolutely terrified at this. I had, a th- I had a wee feeling that you would do something like this. So unless, uh, hopefully, it's not English literature. That's that's no, that's definitely not. I'm sticking. I'm sticking up for the players in this one. Um, <laughs> give you a taste of your own medicine. By the way, some, <laughs> some of these questions are really easy. To be fair, although credit to no, Stuart Finn yeah. for knowing the measurement of horses, his hands. And that was that was quite impressive. I didn't think he would get that, but then again, they call him the human radio and the human encyclopedia, so he's deserved of a, you know. And if anyone looks, you know, at the end of the day, the guy looks like Billy from Beverly Hills Cop. So there's going to be a, an element of getting ripped into. So yeah, no, there is there is that. Um, there's always been a stereotype that footballers aren't the the smartest of people, but um, there is always exceptions to the oh, rule. Um, Stuart Finlay is one of them, uh, it seems, but. Um, yeah, so I've got 10 questions. Shouldn't take us too long. Um, I'll, I'll pretend to, to give you a timer, but we'll really just um, go for it. Um, so first one, um, what do the numbers add up to on the opposite sides of a dice? <laughs> no, the opposite sides of a dice? Yes. 10. 10, no, it's 7. Uh, which country has the world's <laughs> longest coastline? The world's longest coastline? What country? Is that Russia by any chance? No. Wrong again. What name can be a lettuce or a mass of floating frozen water? Oh, an iceberg. Iceberg. In an English trial, how many people sit on the jury? Uh, Ten? Nine? Twelve is. What is the name of Dennis and Dennis? Hang on a minute. (laughs) Everybody knows everybody knows the Scottish one, so we're just going with English (laughs) instead. What is the name of Dennis and Menace's dog? Nasha. Who is the tallest of Robin Hood's men? Oh, good grief. Um, oh, I'm horrendous at this type of thing. Um, I was going to say Maid Marion, but clearly that's not the man. But... <laughs> uh, I don't know. Pass close. on that one. How many are there in a baker's dozen? Uh, 13. That's an easy one. What name is oh, given... I as well. My flat overlooks Browning's, the baker's. Oh, the pie. Yeah. I literally look over the pie factory so I can beat them as they come out there. <laughs> what name is given to the Japanese skill of growing miniature trees? Sorry, rowing miniature trees. Growing miniature trees. Oh, growing, growing miniature trees. Uh, Triami, I don't know. Oh, bonsai. Bonsai. Was that not a programme? Oh, you'd be too young for that. No, far that too bad young bad for bad. that. Even that I was bad <laughs> what, The second last one. What does the Beaufort scale measure? The Beaufort scale? Oh, my God. You're horrendous. <laughs> the Beaufort scale. Something to do yeah. with... Um, Weather, I'll give you a hint. The Beaufort scale. I just heard it, I just heard it there. No, the wind. The wind, strength of the wind. Yes, I'll give you half a point for that one. Last one, I made it easy. Um, August 2017, French football club PSG broke the world record fee for which player? Oh my god, oh, was that not Neymar? Neymar, there we go. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, so you got two, three. Well, that's better than Stephen and Gordon. <laughs> better than Stephen and Gordon right. and Kev, so I'm happy with that. That's mid place, you know. I, I can compete with, my, compete with my colleagues. I have to say they were they were um, slightly difficult. I'm not sure, but um, Are they were. At, at, at the end of the day, everybody, it's all um, relative to to what you know. Some people know things that others don't, and. Well, this is the argument that Stephen O'Donnell and I had after he called me a disgrace, which you can't hear on the We Are Kelly podcast. Shameless plug. Um, but, so he answered Stuart Finlay's questions and got more than Stuart Finlay on Stuart Finlay's questions. And he was, no, nope, this isn't fair. You know, you have to ask us the same questions. Well, I can't because you can hear them every week. No. You know, you don't get the same questions on a pub quiz every week. You don't get down the brass and granite and hear the same questions but on, a, on the Wednesday night pub quiz, do you? No, it's just your luck at the end of the day, though, for that kind of thing. I did, I did, I, <laughs> personally, I do think that Stuart Finlay's questions were easier than any of the others that, we, that we've had so far. Um, I mean, come on, but would you have known how how to measure horses? No, absolutely not. No. Now, but they would say that you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just your luck, as we say. Um, so yeah, you got three out of ten. So um, hopefully, Kev or thirty three percent. That's that. By the way, that's a good rate. By the way, thirty three percent. I'll take that. Hopefully, Kev or uh, Stephen, although I don't listen to this, otherwise you'll be having a hard time. Um, at work when you go back. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll be, I'll be. What, yeah, once this is released, by the way, once we're published, I'll be recording just this wee bit. You got to see <laughs> it. There you go, boys. Don't slag me off. Thank you. <laughs> Have it themselves. Um, so on on Twitter, we asked um, if anyone had any questions for you. 
Uh, we got quite a few coming in, uh, so we'll just do them just now. Uh, Claire Morrison said, who's next in the monster truck for Kelly Oakey? Oh, uh, her and her dad, seeing as how they like to uh, they like to partake in a bit of carpool karaoke themselves uh, on the way to and from games. I would love to do, excuse me, I'd love to do supporters actually at some point. Um, it is something that Scott, Neil, and I have been talking about uh, quite a lot recently. Um, we will be we will be doing more carpool karaoke. Um, what I will say though is it's a heck of a job to do. Yeah. After this Kyle, um, it is a it's a it's a job and a half to do. Um, the editing and the fact that we've got three and four different cameras um, in the in the truck. You know, we've got a couple of GoPros, and then Chris was sitting behind us filming as well. Um, it's it's very it's, it's very time consuming, but we are working on telling them. Basically, we're going to just bribe the players, and we're going to get a handwritten letter from Billy Bowie to say if you don't do it, you're not getting paid. Well, obviously, you're not going to reveal anything if you even know who it's going to be. But um, who do who do you think would be? good at it who do you who do you think is actually quite a good singer Stephen Hendry we've heard is quite into his music but that doesn't Stephen necessarily Hendry. mean that he's good as a singer he but was, he was great however I don't know I'm not sure if you have witnessed Gary Dickel's um Twitter recently he put up a, a tweet saying missing this lot and it was yeah. everyone in the restaurant mm-hmm. singing along to Stevie Wonder I just called to say I love you yeah. which is a phenomenal song so I'm going to Stuart Finlay was giving it big licks in that so um he might be next on our hit list as well mm-hmm. actually Finder's um, Gary Dicker, you, you know, you got to step to the up to the plate here. He's captain, club captain at the end of the day, Adam. So you know, he also has to step up to the plate and set an example. You know, Stephen O'Donnell, phenomenal singer, will always be the best singer. You know, singing the greatest showman. That that's just unbelievable. Um, so I think he would be. Quite, I think I think Dix would be quite good. I think Findles would be quite good. Uh, even Brophy. Oh God, no. Um, who who would I think would? Do you know who I would have actually have loved to have had was Jordan Jones. He'd have been really good value. Very controversial. I'm fully aware of that. Yeah. I still do message Jordan now and again. We'll chat back and forth. Lovely guy. Absolutely gem of a guy. Um, but he'd, he'd have been really good in it. But the current crop of players at the moment, I, Lorenzo Bonescu would have been hilarious. We did actually ask Dan, ba- ask Dan Backman who agreed and we just couldn't get the time to do it. No. I Which think just, been, just I anyone at the end of the day because it is that other you know insight into the players at the end of the day. Do you know who I really want? I have never heard such an eclectic taste in music from anyone ever, but this particular person loves his sax. Alex Dyer. I would love Alex Dyer to come and sing some something in the carpool karaoke truck. That would be amazing. And I'll be on. Maybe some Stevie Wonder or something like that. Oh, like his kind of his kind of deal. Honestly, the guy loves and lives for anything with a bit of sax in it. So uh, no answer on that one, but there's certainly plenty of intent behind the scenes to. Yes, um, yes, we are. Well, I kind of that. give you. A, if I could, I would. Um, but we we genuinely don't have a, a player lined up. And obviously, through these times right now, we locked down. Um, then it's it's very difficult to do that right now. Obviously, with social distancing and stuff, so we couldn't we couldn't do that at the moment. Yeah. But as soon as we're back to normal, trust me, it is at the top of our radar right now. Absolutely. Um, next question from Mr. Stephen Cree of um, <laughs> TV fame: Do you prefer plums or pears? I'm not sure there's some kind of um, slight intent in there from that one, but um, you can answer it like a standard question if you wish. Stephen and I once had this uh, this night, and it was it was just ended up. It was oh my god, it was an amazing night, and there were plums aplenty. Um, there was a shower involved, some plums, and a toilet brush. I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we'll have to get him back on and let's see what his answer to that is. Um, I've had it on before, but I think it's time to to revisit that. Um, from uh, Andrew in Florida, he says, any thoughts to doing halftime activities on Killy TV? Maybe player interviews. Yes, that is that is something that we're looking at. Obviously, um, those that listen to Killy TV or certainly that listen to mm-hmm. our uh, the UK commentary that we do, um, we have been we've been kind of ramping things up a bit recently. I do a or we make up a kind of previously on Killy TV. I don't know if anyone watches Power programs like that, but it was previously on Power. No, obviously not that good, um, but we, we would do a thing going, you know, welcome to, you know, welcome to Kelly TV, uh, here's what happened last time or previously on Kelly, and we'd have a show opener that lasts maybe 90 seconds to two minutes with some bits of commentary or uh, some bits of chat and things like that, so we open up the show with some stuff like that, uh, we do some podcast adverts at halftime now, and 
yeah, it is, uh, to Andrew, it is, it is certainly something that we are working on the logistics of uh, with Sports Media GB, who are our, provi- who are our kind of um, hardware providers. They're the, the people that, that, that look after all the, the technical stuff behind the scenes. So it is something we are uh, we are looking at, I promise, that we are trying to make things um, even better than what they are just now. It's a great service, I think, that we provide. I'm biased, obviously. Uh, one of the commentators is quite dodgy, me. Um, but yeah, these are these are stuff that we're, we're looking at doing is, is enhancing the, uh, the Kelly TV experience. Bear in mind, we're only what a year, two years or so into it now. No, no even two years. So, um, you know, so we are. We're still. There's been a lot of technical issues. There was a lot of uh, behind the scenes problems that we had to iron out, and we feel that we're there with that now. So, you know, hopefully, um, sooner rather than later, we will be able to, to do that. And trust me, it's something that's on our radar. Yeah, absolutely, I think the, the expat fans will all um, be very happy about that. Um, from Stuart Boyd, who's your favourite staff member at the Park Hotel? I assume mm-hmm. that could be quite controversial, as he says any answer besides him is wrong. Uh, Bidey is alright, but I prefer Jackie because she gives me a better discount. No, I'm joking. And <laughs> um, everyone at the Park Hotel, actually, Bidey's a really nice guy. Uh, Jackie's nice, Haley's decent. Um, uh, Taylor's really nice. Everyone, I can't can't read mail. I can't really fault. I'm going to get in trouble for not naming people now. But uh, Morag as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, everyone is is really nice at the Park Hotel, and I think Gordon, the manager, and the team there, they do it, and Katie, they do it. They do a phenomenal job in the in the Park Hotel and Lachlan's. Uh, uh, sorry, Logan's food is just out of this world as well. Get yourself along when it opens up. Uh, from, from Jamie Mitchell, he says, "What's your your favourite name to announce in the lineups before a match? Could be present or in the past." Well, do you know one name I would have loved to have announced would have been Tommy Burns. I got the fortunate I was fortunate to meet Tommy as a as a match mascot against it was Rangers actually in ninety three or something ninety four ninety three something like that. Um, I would love to have announced his name. That would have been amazing just to announce Tommy Burns. Oh. Um, or Freddie Dindaloo would have been another one that I would have loved. Uh, the same way Lekovic are ones that I would have loved to. Um, as a goalkeeper, I am goalkeeper daft. Lekovic, Marshall. Well, I got to Marshall. That was good. I got to announce the likes of Marshall. Colin Meldrum, what a goalkeeper. Um, but one one name that I love currently just now is the Wolf. Eamon, the Wolf Brophy is really good. Um, there's some names that kind of fit into some of the music that we play um, for that. Um, we actually currently use for when we're doing team announcements is we use GV ninety nine problems um, as the backing track, and really it's because we we might have ninety nine problems, but the pitch ain't one, so that's why yeah, that's why we use that. But um, yeah, I think even the Wolf Brophy is probably one of my favourites um, on that one. Alan yeah. Power always gets a rousing reception whenever we go, but even the Wolf Brophy is probably one of my favourites. Oh, absolutely. Um, Gordon Jones, he says, does it annoy you when fans in the East stand boo or sarcastically <laughs> cheer your announcement about the rugby road gates? No, I actively encourage the booing or the cheering, to be fair. This is something I spoke to the board about. Our safety team weren't keen on this at first. Uh, Mark Gaich and, well, Joe Ireland, our new safety off, new head of safety, he's, uh, he's quite keen on it, but Mark had a bit of resistance on it. And for me, it was... I like humour. For me, humour is what gets into people's brains more. You'll get the message across if you make it something quite funny. Yeah. And it kind of just went into this that these stand gates would be closed. And it's the reason they get closed is if we've got intel, there could be a fight or there could be people waiting or if it's a bigger crowd and whatnot. It really is done for safety, 100%. And I would tell you otherwise if it wasn't. But um, I, I prefer it. I like it. Well, you can probably hear now when I uh, and supporters in the East stand, please note that the rugby road gates are... And I'll do that, and then closed or open, and then you get a cheer or a boo or a way or whatever. I just love that. I think it's absolutely class. I think as well. Sometimes you know, if it's a bad game and we're losing, something like that just towards the end of the game can can cheer people up a bit as well. Just gives give them some something to laugh about and um, just give them something a bit happier to to experience rather than what's going on in the pitch. Um, well, I think there was there was a game. What game? What was it? Hamilton. There was no. There was a game recently. And it got a bigger cheer than anything else off the park that day. <laughs> Just relieved that they could go the quick way out to get home. Yeah, exactly. Quickly home. So um, we've got there's quite a, lot, quite a lot of questions to get through here, no, actually. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure how much you can answer this one. I assume this is another um, veiled story. John Boyd, your commentator, tell us about the kebab shop story after Ibrooks. 
unfortunately, I don't remember the uh, the kebab shop story after Ibrox. That was on. Uh, that was fine. That was uh, Boxing Day. Um, John had uh, just told me that he was uh, expecting his wife was expecting they're going to have a baby due in August. Congratulations to them. Um, and we got, for one of a better phrase, um, intoxicated, shall we say. Um, and it was a really good night out. I don't really, apparently there was an incident with a kebab in the kebab shop and about four other people. That toilet brush made an appearance again, so I'm not really sure what happened. I think that tells the story in itself then. <laughs> exactly. People can fill in the blanks and make up their own mind. Um, four questions left. Um, again, I'm... Many- I'm not sure how you, how well you can answer this one. Um, Mada says, opposition player you'd most like to shout, get it up you two after a game. <laughs> Scott Brown, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I love Scott Brown, actually. I would, Scott Brown's the kind of player you would love in your team, but you absolutely hate playing against. Yeah. For the record, Scott is such a lovely guy. Um, I've interviewed him a few times, and uh, any time Stelty are in town, he'll stop and say, says hello and ask how I'm getting on and stuff. He is actually genuinely a really nice guy maybe Kelly fans don't really want to hear that um, but he is uh, he's a lovely guy um, big family man is, is Bruni but um, it's his swagger on the pitch I absolutely love it but I would love nothing more beating Celtic and going here Bruni get it right up you would be phenomenal or Alfredo Morelos is another one as well yeah. because he's just a, uh, he, he's he's his own type of player I suppose is uh, Fredo but uh, uh, there's, there's, there's probably quite a few to be fair. Um, yeah, or any of, the, any of the Air United players as well, actually, and the Air United chairman. That would be good. I get it right up to them. Would be, would be phenomenal. Uh, a couple of questions left. Um, this next one, Kevin Penny says, any chance we could swap rides for a day? I think nope. I think there's this misconception that you ride about in the monster truck all the time. And I do. I, to, be fair, I, to be fair, I do use it for my shopping now and again. It's currently parked at Rugby Park. It needs a service, but in the height of when we're using it, it spends more time in the car park outside my flat than it does anywhere else. <laughs> just, just to show it off more than anything. Well, they keep it. You need to keep these things turning actually, otherwise they get ruined. You know, the, the trucks are not new. I mean, the trucks are what ten year old or something like that, maybe a bit more. Um, so they need to be kept moving about and stuff. Um, we're maybe we're actually potentially looking at something just now to help vulnerable people across East Ayrshire and across Ayrshire mm-hmm. as a whole and maybe using the truck as a bit of a morale booster yeah. um, I would love to go round about some, some houses and whatnot and honk the horn and give everyone a wave and just a bit of a, a morale boost would be quite good but um, it would be it would be good if we can get what we're trying to do off the ground in East Ayrshire Council looking for volunteers at the moment um, for you know delivering shopping and stuff, so I'd quite like to use it for that. But Kevin is a fireman, so if he uh, gives me a shot of his his fire engine and allows me to have a go at the, the sirens going going up John Finney Street with the blues and twos on, then he can have a go at the monster truck any day of the week. Yeah, I'm sure he'll take that. Um, two more. Kelly Drummer he says all time favourite Kelly related moment so far. It's got to be the Scottish Cup, doesn't it? Scottish Cup. I was ten. That was amazing. Um, going back as well to Sir Steve Clark. Sorry, there's more traffic going about. Not a lot of people staying at home, by the way. <laughs> no, I stay doesn't at home. that way. No. Clowns, stay at home. Um, I think it's difficult. The Scottish Cup was amazing. Maybe I didn't get to overly appreciate the Scottish Cup because I was 10. It's amazing, and I remember like it was yesterday because my, my, my younger brother, who hates football, came and played his Game Boy the entire time. At Ibrox, that was amazing. Um, but <laughs> Sir Steve interviewing Sir Steve Clark, that was a high and a low. Realizing when we're getting into Europe, amazing. Watching us win trophies, amazing. It's oh god, coming back to Kilmarnock actually is another favourite killing moment. But um, beating any of the old firm is always a great moment as well. And then, um, although I did enjoy playing the Julian banjos. You know, the theme from Deliverance for Air United running out. I think we won yeah. that. I think that might have been the same night David Hernandez gets sent off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As well. <laughs> Air United board went mental. So that's also a career highlight from a Kilmarnock point of view. No, I can understand what you're saying about the, the Scottish Cup because I think I was 13 when we won the League Cup. And I just, you know, you wish you'd been older to, to yeah. appreciate it more, be able to, to experience it more. But at the same time, I was eight years old for the, the CIS Cup final and I wish I'd been younger yeah. or not born at all. So I didn't have to <laughs> didn't have to go through that <laughs> again. It was that bad. But um, last question from um, Jokey Morris. He says, "Why do you have poppadoms for goalie gloves?" 
this comes from the boy that's uh this comes from the boy who's the left back from our football team, uh, Glencairn Thistle. Uh, joke has got a head like a fifty pence piece. The last game he was trying to head our balls and they were actually putting me under he was trying to head a ball forward for the halfway line and it was actually putting me under pressure to go. You know, that's what we're looking at here. You know, this guy is the cheapest of cheap looking proclaimers uh, tributes you'll ever see in your life with his big milk bottle glasses. So uh I joke you just uh, you stick to the you just stick to trying to defend my man and I'll I'll continue to catch the balls that you clearly can't put anywhere other than back to your own goalkeeper. Oh, what a fantastic way to to end. Um, obviously, uh, as you say, uh, the podcast will be coming out this Friday. Um, yeah. So everyone, make sure you keep an eye out for that. Um, like I said, but, Good Friday's uh, Good Friday's edition. Um, it will certainly assist you in your lockdown listening. So that's a wee clue there as to who's. Um, is that a wee clue as to who's on? Assist? No? No, you tell me. Is reading too much into that? Everyone else can decide for themselves who they, <laughs> who they think it is. <laughs> um, but no, thank you very much, Gavin, for, for coming on. I'm sure that's been a great insight for, for everyone into, into your career and how, how things have passed by in the Kelly world um, from inside of the club. And, yeah, I've been, um, like I say, I've been, I've been really lucky in my career working in so many good radio stations and you know, hitting so many records and stuff like that over the over the year. I was the youngest drive time presenter in the UK at one point at seventeen, and you know, I, I've been really lucky, and my Kelly career has been nothing short of, of phenomenal as well. And I've got a lot of people to thank for helping me and, and obviously coming back to the club. At the end of the day, I'm just the as I keep saying, Adam, I'm just the guy that reads the teams and, and shouts, "We are Kelly." I do my bit for the team, you know, whatever way I can, and I'm just buzzing to be to be back at, at Kelly and. It certainly it only feels as if I've been back for five minutes, but what a whirlwind it's been. No, absolutely. It has, certainly, in the last couple of years. And I'm sure everyone appreciates um, everything that you're doing, especially in those big moments, as we were talking about, um, when you know you just have uh, have those special moments that, that come through. But um, they can find you on Twitter, at Gav underscore Wallace one Anything else you'd yes. like to, if anyone has made it to this far in, um, after an hour and a half, well done um, for making it this far. Um, anything else you'd like to let people know about um, while you're here? Just, just, just remember at the moment, stay safe, look after each other just now. That's the big thing. Please remember your social distancing. The, the more we stay at home, the quicker the government will be will be able to let us out, and we can we can get back on to uh, we can get back on to normal life and get the football back. I think we're all desperate for it, but I think the big thing right now is just please everyone stay safe and. Steve said, "Together we are stronger." You know, together we are Kelly, and I'm just—I can't wait for us to get back to the back to the football. So, I really, really can't wait to, to get back. And I'd actually one other thing—I was, I was just about to start doing my SFA goalkeeping badges, so I'm uh, I'm, I'm buzzing. Literally, was just about to start the course, and then all of this happened. So, um, it just happens at the wrong time. Then that didn't have. So I'm looking forward to all that and getting back to play football and just get back to some sort of normality. But. Um, I'm thank you very much for having me on. I know you you might have been desperate this afternoon. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, no, thank you very much. Um, as we say, and I'm sure that there'll be plenty from the club um, and from from ourselves as well as we go through this. And as you say, in the words of Steve Clark, together we are stronger, and hopefully we'll be back at Rugby Park soon um, to listen to to We Are Kelly and to to see if we can either close out the season or or start a new one afresh. So. Um, thank you once again for coming for coming on. Um, I'm sure it was a great insight for everyone. That well, um, was great fun. Thank you for having on. Um, you can find us on uh, Twitter at One Team Ayrshire. Make sure you subscribe here on YouTube. And uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic uh, interview. Congratulations <laughs> if you got to the end. An hour and a half long. Um, so uh, yeah, great stuff. Uh, thanks to Gavin again. And uh, we'll see you uh, for the next time uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks. <laughs>